William Miner was one of the most important and influential people in the history of the North Country. Among his many major accomplishments was building the region's first hospital that has grown today into a state-of-the-art medical center. Coming up later this month, we're going to present a documentary on William Miner's life and his lasting legacy of generosity to the North Country. Orphaned at the age of 10, William Miner was sent to far upstate New York to help on his aunt and uncle's farm in Shea Z. He would learn the hardships of farm life and the values of hard work, but his future lay west with engineering school and the railroad industry. William would return to his beloved North Country a multi-millionaire and embark on massive construction projects the area had never seen before. He did things in this North Country that nobody had ever done before and probably never would do at any foreseeable time in the future. An immense farm with over 300 buildings and 800 employees. He always has to do things big time. The electrification of the region, building hydro dams and power plants. The amount of labor it took to get that work done and the fact that they could do it in such a short period of time is just amazing to me. One of the first centralized rural schools in America, bringing kids from miles away on horse-drawn buses. In the middle of this little village rose this huge Spanish mission building with towers. And a state-of-the-art hospital that Charles Mayo of the famous Mayo Clinic called the most thoroughly equipped hospital he had ever seen. The cost of constructing and equipping the hospital was $4 million, which in today's dollars would be about $55 million. Some claim he didn't earn his fortune. There's a persistent rumor that Miner met some poor unfortunate and that Miner stole the design and then got it patented, made millions of dollars. But historical research shows otherwise. It isn't like William Miner went out and invented a draft friction gear. Westinghouse was developing a draft friction gear and GE was developing a draft friction gear. The draft gear existed in various different forms, but it just didn't work as well as the one that Will invented. While some of his projects are now crumbling to the forces of nature, others are thriving and reveal how William Miner's rags to riches story is still going strong over 100 years later. And with us now, the producer of that documentary, Paul Frederick. Many people who are longtime viewers will certainly recognize you. Many years of producing documentaries and, and many, many episodes of Roadside Adventures and People Near Here with Derek Bearden. Yep. It's yep. good to see you, welcome. Well, thanks, Tom. Anybody who grew up in the North Country who has lived here has certainly heard of Meyer, but did a lot of people really not understand how much he did for the North Country? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's one of those things where people heard his name and they go, oh yeah, you know, and they throw out one of the myths that have really been prevalent. And they didn't really know a lot about the full story of his life. And uh, I just wanted to kind of dig in deep and get to the bottom of what his life really was and show people what he contributed to our, our region. I mean, I can't think of anyone before his time or since who did as much for this region as William Miner did. So he was orphaned at the age of 10. 10, yes. And that's when he came here to the North Country to live with his aunt and uncle on the farm. Correct. Grew up on the farm, but then went out west looking to make his fortune. He had a brother-in-law who was head of the bridge division of the Wabash Railroad and said, come on out, I'll get you a good job and get you started. And that started him on his career with the rail industry. From the ground up? From the ground up, right. And that's where he made his millions. Yeah, definitely was in the rail industry. But, but now the other myth is that he instantly got rich. It took almost a decade for him to really, he worked for other companies, he, other rail industries. Uh, um, it took him almost a decade to finally start his own business and be able to quit his other job and, and just have minor enterprises uh, for his you know, main source. And minor enterprises is what made the 
the, the shock absorber the, that yep, he made uh, yep, the so that the rail cars and all wouldn't the other devices, yes. crash into one another. So once he made his millions, when did he decide to come back to the North Country? 1903, he came back to the North Country. Going back to the myths, everyone always thought he had this plan from the day he left, he was gonna go away, make a bunch of money and come back. That really wasn't the case. He, at one point while he was gone, he was writing letters to his aunt who was still here, hmm. saying, I'm thinking about selling the property. He had sort of bought the property from when his uncle died. And he th said, I was thinking about selling it. So he didn't really have this grand plan of coming back. Hmm. But what happened was, uh, they, him and Alice had a son who lived for about, I don't know if it was eight or 10 days and passed away and I kind of think that that kind of brought him back to his youth and he wanted to, you know, I guess come back and start coming back to his roots and uh, relive it and start this farm. He, he also had this, um, this plan to show country folks um, how country life can compete with city life um, with some scientific uh, advancements in farming. So mm. he wanted to create a super farm where scientific methods could be employed and uh, hopefully keep people on the farm. So he and his wife Alice moved back yeah. and, and uh, took the small farm that his aunt and uncle had had and turned it into one of these, into the super yeah, farm. Yeah, I mean, it really was a super farm too. It, it went from, I think, one house, a small farmhouse and two barns. And by the time he was done, it, it, it was over 15,000 acres, 300 buildings, mm. 800 employees. You know, in typical miner fashion, everything had to be done in a massive scale and he kind of got carried away. Um, as a matter of fact, it, it sort of backfired because he made it so uh, elaborate that the normal, regular, everyday farmer in the area couldn't emulate that. They went to it and checked it out on weekends. They had farm meetings there, but then they would go back to their regular farms and farm the way their grandfathers had. So the vision he had was just too grand for many yeah. other farmers. They just couldn't afford to do what he was. To do it on that scale. Was... And to, but um, he did a lot of things. Like he was one of the first to tile the field. You know, with the they were clay tiles to help drainage. Um, which is common He's, today, but a century ago. Right, no one was doing it. And he, and he uh, studied the feed. He would have 10 pig pens lined up and he'd put in different feeds with different formulas and see which one produced the best hmm. uh, outcome. So he was scientifically doing things, but it was just on such a massive grand scale that they couldn't really keep up. That actually kind of leads into, I think the light bulb went off in his head that, well, maybe the uh, this idea of education and educating farmers needs to happen earlier when they're in school. And that kind of led to the formation of the Shazy Central School. So he consolidated 11 area schools and built the first Correct. rural centralized school district in the state of New York. In New York, and, and it's, it's kind of hard to verify, but it, it's probably the first in the country. Hmm. It's, um, it was studied for many years after he built it. <laughs> and just like the farm, on a grand scale, a, a school yeah. with two swimming pools and a, and a cafeteria, and, and for the first and an time- an elevator that could uh, take a whole class of kids up, a, an auditorium for 1,100. And for the um, first time, picking the kids up at home and taking busing. them home, a horse-drawn school buses. Exactly, yeah, and uh, again, at massive scale, but um, that's just the way he operated. Everything had to be just right and spared no expense. The hospital was built for $4 million in the 1920s, which today is $55 million mm. or more. Paid for it all out of his own pocket. There was another project that he, he, he wanted to provide electricity for not only his farm, but for the community. And so he had a number of, of dams and power stations, and then he took on this huge project. He wanted yeah. to create a, a hydro project, a, and he built a, a massive dam. And uh, I guess that was the, the one project that he undertook that he never really succeeded at. Yeah, it was, um, it was on this property called the Altona Flat Rock. It's a very um, hard rock packed landscape, very barren, not really good for anything. So he deemed it as, and it was close to his farm, and he said, this is the perfect place. His engineers looked at it and said, well, part of the hill you wanna 
build this wall, the hill around it is full of porous rock and it's going to leak. He didn't believe them, went ahead and uh, at the time, it was 1911, spent over a million dollars building this. Hmm. And two or three years later, closed the doors, sure enough, it leaked. So then, it's really amazing, he poured cement all over that hill. Uh, quarter mile by almost three quarters of a mile long. Yeah. I can't even tell you how many thousands and thousands of yards of cement. By 40 pound bags, these guys were just pouring it all over the ground, trying to get it to seal. And then the frost would come, <laughs> form cracks, mm -hmm. so they'd take tar. It did hold water for about seven years, um, but it just was a, it, it kept leaking and they gave up on it around 1917. His farm was a success. I mean, it was huge. Yeah. He supplied dairy and meat and produce uh, to hotels and to restaurants the, yeah. from the, here to Chicago. Montreal, Chicago, New York City, all the biggest hotels, real fancy boxes. I mean, it was like a high-end brand. And then as time went on, its mission changed. I think one of the biggest accomplishments of, of William Minor was the establishment of his foundation. After he had built the hospital, he realized, I need some kind of funding source to keep these going long after I'm gone. So he started the foundation, um, and that had some vision, you know, to keep these things going. The three things were to fund the, the school, the hospital, and an institute to be created at a later time for education in agriculture. It took until 1950, however, because of the you know, the market crash in the 30s and the depression before there was enough money to actually start the institute, which they called the Miner Institute. That mm -hmm. does have Miner's name, but that was done well after he was gone. Yeah. But um, He so wanted to carry on training new generations of, of farmers correct, and right. agricultural engineers. Yeah, and I mean, it kind of goes back to why he started his farm in the first place. Th that idea that, you know, um, through scientific uh, knowledge and advancements, we can make farming you know, better and more productive. And so in the 1950s, it's a little complicated in there. There was a, a college they started that didn't really last long, and then mm. they started an inst the institute, which is still going strong and is actually considered one of the leading institutes, agricultural research institutes in the whole world. He and Alice never had any other children. No, no. When they had that one child, she was 39 and, you know, so... So there were no the, descendants to, to carry on his legacy? No, no. And your premiere at the renovated Strand Theater in downtown Plattsburgh, an it was, incredible, it was incredible turnout, it was a, packed house. It was a hot August night. It was very warm and uh, the turnout, uh, it seats 900 and I think every seat was sold and some people were turned away at the door. Um, just shows you the the... A connection people still do have to, to William Minor. Paul Frederick, uh, Heart's Delight, the William Minor story is the name of the documentary. It will premiere on Mountain Lake PBS coming up on Tuesday, November 29th at 8 p.m. And you will be with us in the studio yes, that night. Looking so we're looking to forward it. to that. That'll be a, a wonderful evening and uh, folks will be able to see this this documentary that uh, that you've produced. And we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Tom.